thanks to the American Legion for allowing us to host these presentations for over 10 years. This, this has been great. Uh, it's a perfect venue for what we do. And thanks so much for the wait staff. We do such a great job every time. We change the uh, we change the menu around a little bit to make it easier for everybody, the, the, the people in the kitchen, the servers, and for the, the, the people attending. And I think it works out OK from what I've heard. Also like to thank Cats TV. Here's Dave, our, our recording guy back there. Glad to see him here. They've been here seven years or so doing this for us. A uh, very important service for us uh, is it allows us to upload each program to YouTube for people who can't make it to the live programs. In addition, it also allows these great uh, local history lectures to be put on display for all those who follow us. The idea here is to preserve, preserve as much local history as possible, and CATS allows us to do just that. Uh, there are, in fact, several local history-related organizations in town, and we all try to support and uh, work with each other to preserve our history. Besides the History Club, there's the Monroe County History Center, of which I've been a board member for the last three years, uh, Monroe County Public Library, IU Photo Archives, as of course, Catch TV, Wiley House Museum, and others. Uh, also, thanks to our loyal history enthusiasts who attend uh, and watch these programs. Very much appreciated. Uh, we had many, many different subjects we've covered over the years from stone mills to inquiries to RCA, Showers Brothers Factory, history of uh, local post offices, history of Hoosier hysteria, old photos from the Herald Telephone, barns, city parks, Monon Railroad, West Baden, of all places, uh, and much, much more. Uh, how many new attendees do we have today? Very many? That's a few. Yeah. <laughs> Now, if you want to get on our regular mailing list, just drop your, your email address to me, and I'll give it to uh, my good friend George, who can't make it today, but uh, he's the one that loads all those up for the uh, monthly uh, uh, words to send out for the uh, new programs, for each new program. Uh, let's see. So I got that. So I'd like to introduce Daniel Schlegel, the director of the Monroe County History Center, who does a great job there. Fantastic. He's got a few words to say. Thank you, Michael. I always look forward to History Club each month because I'm always excited about the speakers. And today's speaker I've been looking forward to since Michael told me it was on the agenda. So I'm going to be brief so we can get to our speaker. Um, I just want to let everyone know we have two exhibits that are coming down in late June. So before they come down, please stop by and see us. We have one from the Bloomington Watercolor Society called We Paint History. They painted both people and places throughout Monroe County's history. So make sure to come in and see this amazing artwork. And if you are so moved, I think all of the pieces are for sale. If not, most of them are for sale. If you need some artwork for your house or as a gift, make sure to swing by and see this great exhibit that's up. And we also have the Alexander Memorial, all about the restoration of it and how it came to be. We even have Alexander's will on display for you to see how he dedicated part of his estate to go towards building this memorial. So it's a really neat thing that we have up on display. So make sure to stop in and see us. And then after both of those come down, we have a very ambitious exhibit we're quite excited about called Breaking the News all about the newspaper history and all the different newspapers that have been through our community over the years. So it's gonna be three galleries worth of an exhibit. So our biggest exhibit that we've ever had is going up on July 17th. So make sure to come by and see us for that. But before that, and starting next week, we have our annual garage sale. So if you've not been to this, um, it's, it's not a garage sale. It is literally, it's just shy of one acre under roof. It is humongous. For members and Cook employees, it's next Wednesday, June 7th. So I did bring some membership brochures for anyone interested. You can also sign up to be a member online or you can swing by the History Center. We always love visitors. There's a lot of great perks for it. And then the public days are next Friday the 9th and Saturday the 10th. 
So make sure to mark your calendars, come out. I have a bunch of little hand cut flyers we have, just as a gentle reminder. I always need to put one of these on my fridge personally, so make sure to come by and see. We have a whole lot of books over here. I try to get anything based on limestone over there. And we're always happy to see you. So even if you just want to stop by and look around the History Center, you're always welcome. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. And we'll see you at the garage sale next week. Thanks, Daniel. Now I'm going to run down our coming attractions. We're, we're scheduled into next year, which is pretty cool. Uh, Next month, June 27th, James Capshu, who's the official historian of Indiana University, will be giving a program called Beyond Being Lucky, Herman B. Wells and Indiana University, The Life and Times of Herman B. Wells. Uh, July 25th, the history of Cats TV. The people at Cats TV are going to give a program for us about uh, their history. They've been here over 45 years doing things like this to serve the public. August 29th, uh, Christine Friesel of Monroe County uh, Public Library will give a program called Monroe County Gilded, Mapping the Gilded Age, 1877 to 1899. It covers the Dunn, Wardburn letters and other uh, prominent families of the time. What was life like in Bloomington and Monroe County uh, during the era known as the Golden Age? September 26th, Dr. Clay Stuckey, a good friend of mine, is going to do a program, which is, this will be a biggie. <laughs> the, it's called The Brief History of the Bloomington High School Campus. And of course, a lot of us went to the old BHS, the old Bloomington High School. Uh, it'll be great. There'll be many Im images to be shown. October 31st, Rod Spa is going to give a program on the local Feltus family and their family newspaper, which was a weekly newspaper way back in the day. Uh, November 28th, Duncan Campbell, who's given a few programs before, will give a program called the Indiana Barn in Transition. Uh, January 2nd is still open, but I'll get that closed before too long. January 30th, Dr. John Butler, who's another guy that's given several programs, uh, will give a program presentation called Depots, Platforms, and Flag Stops, a History of Railroad Places in Monroe County. February 27th, 2024, Jill Vance will give a program called To Build a Reservoir, The Origins of Monroe Lake. Now today we have Susan Snyder Salmon, and uh, her program is entitled "If Stone Walls Could Talk." It's about dry stack stone walls or fences, which are all over the county. So uh, there's so much history to these, and uh, Susan, let you take it away. <laughs> you okay over there? We're good. <laughs> Here's Susan. Well, as a first uh, generation Monroe Countyan, I love to be here and see my elders in the room. I um, want to thank my husband, Glenn, who is down here, and my sister in law, Pat Salmon, who is a Headley, who grew up in Unionville. If you happen to know Pat, she's in for the week and you can say hello to her down there. Can you all hear me okay? Is that close enough? No, it needs to be louder. Okay, right in my face. Got it. Okay, we have to do a little switch here. And give me just a minute to get this. Did you enjoy the pictures? The close-ups are terribly important because this one right here, we'll talk about a little bit later, but it look really close at some of those designs in there. Do you see anything that looks like Chex cereal? Look real close. You see it? We're going to come back to that, so don't forget. All righty, how do I get out of here? Escape. Hiding. Sapper was hiding. Okay, so thank you for having me here. I actually am a member of the Monroe County Historic Preservation Board of Review. And I want to be sure that you know down here at the end we have some information about historic preservation in the county. 
uh, along with some driving tours and some stories about stone walls and preservation efforts that are underway. And my being here is because the identification of where the walls are and their history is a, one of the projects of that board. So I'm very happy to be here as a representative from that organization from Monroe County and to ask for all of you to be a part of this uh, limestone effort because these walls actually are made from limestone that I'm going to be talking about. And in fact, we have samples of the stones. I won't throw this out because it's really quite heavy. But down here at the end, there are some samples from several different uh, stones, uh, fences around the county. So there are also some township maps uh, that show each townships that are, that are current and modern so you can actually tell where things are. And I would ask that if you know of a wall or if you know where a wall used to be, that you take a post-it note and make a note and put it on the township map where you believe that that wall might have been. Even if you're not sure if it was the kind of wall that I'm talking about today, go ahead and make a note because then we can use that as a, a database to work from. All right. So I, here we have the Monroe County History Club. Uh, let's see. Error, user error. There we go. If walls could talk. Michael and I talked a little bit about what to call this, and I thought, well, if you build it, they will come. Well, that didn't quite work. So I said, okay, well, how if walls could talk? Because if they could, they would tell us when they were built and by whom and why, which is something that we are trying to explore. Now, the term dry stone walling and dry stack stone wall. There's lots of different ways that people say the same thing. But in the end, if you go back to originally in Scotland and Ireland, you will recall from your early history that there are lots and lots of walls in that area. And when people immigrated to this country, uh, they were in New England and began to stack those little stones that came up through the ground. Uh, that, that frustrated every farmer, and they made walls because what else are you going to do with them? You're going to pile them in a, a big pile, or are you going to make something useful out of them? The same sort of phenomena is affecting these dry stack stone walls. The difference is how they're constructed, how they're built, and how long they last. Going back to Ireland and Scotland, a lot of our settlers who came into Virginia and then through into Kentucky and morphed on up into Hoosier land, a lot of those folks had a tremendous amount of experience with the dry stack stone walls because in Kentucky there's a huge area. Think of Lexington and draw a big donut around it. And geologically that area is very similar to parts of what we have. And that these, this lovely layer of limestone that lends itself to making the walls, it just presents itself right there at the surface. So we've got this wave of people who came into Indiana through Virginia to Kentucky and up, and we have a huge number of people who came into Monroe County directly from Ireland and Scotland. And so we have a, a mix of things. It's, it's not all the same people building the walls, and they're not all built at the same time, at least not that we've been able to figure out. And if you've got a question, please ask it. Um, I, I can take questions as we go, for sure. Oh. If I can just get this properly functioning. Next. Back. OK, so just some factoids. Um, different publications will use different types of explanations. Rock fence typically is like what I mentioned in New England. Rocks come up through the ground, they make a pile of them, and they, they put them into a, a, a fence pattern. Stone fences typically, in most publications that were early, will, will indicate that something was quarried or gathered and intentionally shaped and dressed. And my husband reminded me, have you ever seen? Sure. People sitting on the floor. Oh my goodness! There are chairs up here. Okay. All right. Back to the ranch. 
Yes, anything more? We're good, all right. So the stone fences are intentionally shaped and just think about it, take, t squirrel your brain around this, take a bunch of rocks and then figure out how you're gonna make that. All right, any quilters in the room? Yeah, kind of sort of like that a little bit, but this is much harder because those things are heavy. The earliest fences that we have, and I'm talking about the dry stack stone walls, and that means there's no mortar. They are dry stacked. Someone thought through which stone goes where and how it's organized and what the bed looks like and how long it's going to be and how tall it's going to be, and they do it all without mortar. And it's ingenious design, really, because they withstand frost and wet and snow and ice. The, the coping stones, which typically are at an angle, shed the water off. And those walls, some of them are as old as 300 years in this country. You get into Virginia and eastern Kentucky, and you can see walls that are early as 1790. So these things have been around for a while. Um, and they do mirror the, the ones that we see in Scotland and Ireland. Again, the folks came from there, so they use techniques that they use back home. It's an obvious thing you would do. By the 1890s, uh, the quarried walk fences were very common in the Kentucky bluegrass. How many of you have driven around, uh, done, done the bourbon tour? Anybody done the bourbon tour? Okay. You can't miss the, the fences. They're absolutely ubiquitous. They're on every corner, hiding behind everybody's house. They're just everywhere in Scott County and um, down in the Shaker Town. They've got, they've got 500 miles of these walls. I mean, I, if you were a Shaker, I'm not sure you had much else to do, but they're also five or six feet tall, but 500 miles, come on. It's huge. If you've never been there, you have to go if you like walls because they're really, it's really crazy. But in Kentucky, one of the things that I like is um, they, were, they were trying to get people through, right? And, and, and have these, they created toll roads, which we still have. And the toll roads, a property owner was required to build a fence on both sides of their property or if there were two property owners adjacent to each other and creating a tunnel. And the toll road was a toll house, and that way you couldn't escape the toll. You, you, were, you were stuck in this little, you know, the lane on the highway you don't want to be in? You had to go through that lane, and you had to pay the toll. So in Kentucky, a lot of the walls are related to toll roads. But basically, there are fences built from rock cleared from the land. Sometimes, and in particularly in parts of Monroe County, they were harvested from creek areas, and occasionally a few might have been quarried. Uh, many walls were used, uh, in, and we know this anecdotally and through some historic uh, references that, uh, particularly in Kentucky, these folks were going back to England to get purebred stock, stock and, and they kind of wanted them to remain purebred, right? So the fences were designed to keep the stock separate and the bloodlines pure. That was one of the incentives to build these fences. What they found out is that if you build a wood fence, in 10 years, you're going to have to replace it. Because what happens, it degrades and goes back to the earth. So if they're properly built and maintained, they can actually last hundreds of years. Uh, what we find, though, is that these particular dry sack stone walls can only be present where the stone is naturally present as well, unless somebody's crazy enough to haul it in from somewhere. So what we find in Monroe County and what we find in the bluegrass region of Kentucky is that the particular kind of limestone is right there at the surface, in your face. Now, sometimes the stone was gathered. It was like in the field. You can see pictures in Kentucky of just a, a slight worn area in the field and an outcropping. There's one like this on North College, past McDonald's as you're going towards Speedway. Off on the right, you see that sort of slaty rock. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that is the same rock. I haven't stopped to check it, but it's right where it should be. And it just sort of can fall into nice little layers and easily be cut. Sometimes if a lot of work is being done and we have a rumor information through a couple of resources 
that Maple Grove, some of the, the Owens Farm, which we'll talk about, uh, some of that rock may indeed have been quarried from Stouts Creek and brought out, actually carved out and not just gathered. So those are things we're still learning. This is a new project, so uh, we have a lot going on. Um, what I've done is some work, uh, thanks to the History Center, I've spent several hours looking at the census records. We had a lot of rock masons and stonemasons living in Monroe County as early as the 1830s, the 1840s, and 1850s. Now, these were folks that were not working in the stone quarries because we were not yet in that, that work yet. That was yet to come. That's a little later. Matthews first opened his uh, Ellettsville uh, quarry in the 1870s. So we're still, we had people here. What were they doing? Well, they were probably using limestone to help build houses, but some of them for sure were working on the limestone fences that we see. That's Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Now I have to, uh, Michael will like this. In 1828, there was an ad um, for Indiana advertising land for sale where there was outstanding and useful timber, limestone quarries, and springs of never failing water. We were actually advertising this to bring people here. So they, they knew about it. So the walls are built without mortar and that's the why they're dry. Uh, dry stack stone walls can be found where the stone is easily available. And they were also frequently used to demarcate uh, land lines, uh, property lines. Uh, in addition to keeping stock separate or maybe a field separate, uh, one place on Maple Grove Road has a real high fence. Uh, they call it the rabbit garden because it's high to keep the rabbits out uh, from that part. And it was in a house garden inside several other layers of rock walls. In Kentucky, the quarrying and construction work was often done by contract. And I'll just take a moment to say someone just handed me a few minutes ago a contract for a stone wall built in Monroe County. And all of you have one of these hiding in your basement, I know. So I want you to go find them. This is a contract to build the wall at Mount Gilead. It's dated 1888, and we have the names of the people who built the wall. And make a mental note, they were paid if 850 a rod, and we'll talk about that distance of 16 and a half feet a little bit later. Everybody knows somebody who's got a document like this that relates to fences, and I want them all. So. so we also have stories, particularly in the Maple Grove area, where a lot of folklore study was done in the 1970s, where stones were put on cart down in stone in, in Stout Creek, and then brought up by oxen wagon up the hill, particularly for the um, Maple Grove church uh, wall that's, that's there. We also know who built that, when they built it, and how much they were paid. So stay tuned, because that slide is coming up. So building of several walls is, is widespread, um, and it, it happens where the stones are available, but you know that pesky barbed wire stuff? Once that started to become readily available, we see less and less of this kind of thing happening, and plus the world changed. The world changed in the late 1800s. How many of you thought these walls were built by the CCC in the 1930s? Yeah, there's some people who were thinking that that might be the case. The truth is, the CCC, during the WPA period, did work on rebuilding walls. And they're responsible for a lot and more in Lawrence County. There's a historic site just south of our county line at Avoca, which used to be a fish hatchery that's now a park. And the Hamer Brothers built a big uh, in there, and, and the walls go all the way around, and the same walls are present at Spring Mill, but they have something that dry stack stone walls don't. Anyone want to guess? Mortar. You can always tell from the original walls uh, to something that was done later by the mortar, and sometimes the way they're built and the shape. And oh, I want to go back to that one, because the, the last one here is sometimes people did it because they could. The rocks were there, they had the property, they had the wealth, and they wanted it to show. That's okay. We all have a little ego in our lives. And there's a bit of that that, that must be behind 
some of the amount of walling that was done on different properties. So uh, who are our geologists in the room? Okay, if I stumble, please don't say anything out loud, okay? All right, we're, we're going to do the science nerd trip here. All of you know what Salem limestone is, right? Where do we live? Limestone capital of the world, right? Salem limestone. The neat thing about the Salem limestone that's used everywhere in all of the famous buildings that came from here and from Bedford is it can be cut in any direction. It's a very fine grain, and its usefulness as a building stone is, is unheralded. The difference is that in Indiana, it's right here at the surface. In other places, it's buried deep. So if you look here, how do I do that? Yeah, see the 12 right here? The, that's the Mississippian. I don't expect you to remember all the layers. We're, I'm going to show you a chart here in a minute. But you can see how it starts up here north of Owen County, slips down through Monroe, and goes all the way down. That's where we see the Mississippian rock. And uh, the Salem limestone is one of those rocks. Guess what's right below it? The rock that builds the fences, called Harrodsburg. We'll talk about that, too. So if you look at this, this is the crazy chart, you know, that has all of the, the Borden group and the Sanders group and the Mississippian ages. But for me, it's a little easier just to look up close. Around uh, Bedford, you'll see a lot of the St. Louis limestone. Uh, the Salem limestone is what we see here with our big blocks that you're used to seeing in all the quarries uh, and along the roadsides, cast away. And then the Harrodsburg limestone. And down there in the bottom, oh, no, sorry. I'm not where I thought I was. Anybody recognize that building? Thank you, I IU Archives, and that is uh, noted on the slide that it came from IU Archives. That's the old field house at IU, the stadium. The breaking away stadium, right? Really neat angle, that's, that's the limestone. And it's used a lot in the, the uh, Bloomington campus buildings. How many of you seen the stadium from this angle? Isn't that cool? That's just one of the best pictures ever. And of course, that's all built from uh, the Indiana Limestone Company and uh, locally quarried stone. This is a cut from Hardin, Kentucky, just south of Evansville. But I wanted to use it because you can see it's a really good picture that shows how the layers form. And this is the Salem limestone. And right down here, this kind of crumbly brown stuff is the Harrodsburg that I'm going to be talking about. So you can see how, in some places, the Salem may be 70 or 80 feet deep. Um, the Harrodsburg tends to be a little less uh, common. All right, who likes fossils? You go get geode? All right, geodes are abundant here. Fossils are abundant here. And this layer of, of, uh, of stone called Harrodsburg that was first identified here in Indiana, similar layer in Kentucky with a different name, by the way, uh, these are very common fossils that appear in this labor. I, my favorite was always crinoids. And there's a place in Monroe Lake where that Harrodsburg is right along the shoreline. And you can't collect it there. And Jill Vance will tell you, no, 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 you can't collect there. But you could look until your heart's content because there's fossils absolutely everywhere. And then you've got the Bryzoans, which are one of my favorites. Remember when I talked about the Czech cereal? Well, that's it. If you see something that looks like Czech cereal, that is Harrodsburg limestone. That's the easy way to spot it. And if you look at all of the rocks down at the end, you'll see in every single sample, you will see a piece of those fossils, particularly the Bryzoans, and a little bit of, don't eat it, it's really not Czech cereal. But that's the neatest thing is to learn uh, what the stone is because that tells us how the, then the fences are built. Uh, this is Polly Surgeon. You may or may not know her. She's an educator with the geology department here. Um, she's actually the president of the Monroe County Historic Preservation Board of Review right now. And she was showing me this cut, uh, which the, the, the big part here is the Salem. 
And then down here, you've got the, uh, the there's a transitional layer below the Harrodsburg that's a little more uh, crumbly, a uh, few more fossils. And uh, of course, she's uh, showing me this. Do you know where this is? It's right here in town. Cascades, exactly. As you're coming from the, uh, above the hill at the golf course and coming all the way down that hill, if you just look to the west side, you can see six layers of Mississippian stone exposed right there. That's pretty cool uh, all by itself. All right, so show me, where are they? Who knows where there's a stone stack drywall somewhere in the county? Got a few hands up? I'll bet you know where there are some fences that you don't even know there are fences because you'd have never noticed them. They kind of hide in plain sight. All right, so where are they? Back. This is an uh, homage to Michael Carter because this map that I'm using. Hello, next. There it is. It's schizophrenic, I'm sorry. Let me get to it. Next. Next. There you go. 1856. You can see a few spots on it. I can see it on somebody's desk and they were drinking. You know, maybe that's, who knows, coffee. But this, this is available online. You can get it at the geology. You can also see copies of various other states. But you can see it's an outline of Monroe County. Uh, and even though it's weathered and stained, it lists the current property owners. We call it a plat map. And it's one of the best tools for historians in this time period, because it tells us exactly who owned the property at a particular point. And it's, it's very important for us in doing research of the, on these walls to be able to figure out who owned them and when they bought the property to begin the process of dating. Now, the homage to Michael, of course, is that on this document are some ads. Uh, a little bit weathered, but there's attorneys in there and other stuff, so I just thought this was fun and I wanted to share. He's looking right at it, too. So we're going to pop down to uh, Clear Creek. So um, the Step Vendor Farm is going up to the state level for the National Register uh, nomination process on 17th of June. So wish it well. It'll be approved, I'm sure, and then be forward to the federal level for National Register uh, acceptance. A lot of that work has been done by Danielle Banchett Bell, and she and I have chatted quite a bit back and forth about trying to figure out when we want to try to date these walls. So with the, this is all a work in process, progress. We know what we know now. We don't know what we don't know now. And just like a little while ago, we found out a whole lot more. So I do, part of my whole hope to be here when I reached out to Michael to do this program was to try to reach out to the community to find out what little gems are hiding in those boxes in your attics. So any information, any photos uh, with people, you're focusing on the photo, but is there a wall in the background? Anything like that, you want to get it to us so we can begin to analyze it. But I have uh, kind of blown up the, the map here of the area. And this is Perry Township. Everybody knows where Perry is. Go south toward Clear Creek. Um, just go down 69 and take the, uh, oh, the new four lane 37 toward Bedford. And as you crest past that intersection, you've got a lovely gas station right here, right? You've got Dillman Road crossing down in front of you. But as you open up that whole valley and Victor Pike crosses in front of you, Right over that hill is the Stepbender Farm. And it has amazing stone fences. And if you've never been, you just, I hope what you all do is get in your car and go for a ride. Because these fences are amazing. This is one of them um, coming up here. Let me just go ahead and go to that slide. This one shows the side of the house here. And one of the neatest things about this wall is we know from that 1856 plat map that there was a road called, at that time we believe, Springville Road, which obviously would have gone to Springville. The road went directly through the middle of the property. So what do you think they did? They probably had stone walls on both sides. 
and this was one of those walls. There's a spot where there are just a few limestone steps just hanging out, just hanging out, nothing, lead to nothing. Turns out that they actually led to access to a spring the owners created for passerbys to water their horses and to cool them and get water as they were going back and forth along the highway. All right, so we know that George and Mary Stipp purchased 300 acres from the Campbells back in 1873. And their estate included the uh, border of Clear Creek to the east. Uh, they had come from the Harrodsburg area. And if you remember Colonel Ketchum, that's where he first settled in 1816 and bought property in that area in Harrodsburg. So they had settled there coming up from Kentucky. And then they moved over and bought these 300 acres. As they began to build circa 1882 is when we believe those walls may have started to be built. Again, they're not dated. There's no particular, um, I know Danielle has done exhaustive research, and we cannot find any documentation of when those walls were actually created. There's a possibility that they were created before that, and we'll do some research and see if that takes us anywhere. After 1901, after Sip's death, family members sort of subdivided it. There's some subdivisions now. And in 1934, the Benders purchased it. That's the name, Stiff Bender. And they, they continued farming. So we're grateful for them, and they didn't remove a lot of the walls. Um, the derivation for the date is unknown. This is actually from the National Register uh, nomination, and it documents that, to the best we know, it's possibly concurrent with the Maple Grove Road, which we're going to discuss next with that area. Um, and it certainly was um, not later than 1890. It was certainly before that. But we believe the best time frame, given the ownership and the wealth reported of those folks through taxes and deeds and census reports, is that it was likely be in the 70s, in the 1870s and 1880s. So we're still doing research. Um, the old roadbed is there, and one of the walls is there. So it's a really fun um, area. I wanted to show you this map of Kentucky so you could see what I was talking about. This area is the bluegrass area. The, the, the bourbon run runs right through there. Um, and the, the walls in that area uh, are, are so similar to the walls in our area. It's interesting to note that George Stipp, who bought this property, his daddy came from here. So his daddy knew about the walls. His daddy saw the walls. And it, his daddy was used to the rocks in the field. So I'm thinking there's a connection there. I don't know what it is yet. All right, let's go north. Go north. Think uh, bypass, old bypass, new bypass. Go toward Ellisville, Arlington Road. Old Arlington Road used to go used to get off there in that squirrely little intersection. Now you have to go over Arlington Road. And there's a sharp sort of right-hand turn on the Maple Grove. Everybody know where we are? All right, good place to be. Stout Creek starts just south of that intersection, runs along the whole trajectory of the Maple Grove region. And this is another copy blown up of the area we're going to talk about, which is where the Ben Owens, Tom Owens farm is. And look right there at the stone. What do you see? You see the checks. Yeah, there you go. And see how long these walls are? And then there's a wall back along here. Ben Owens built a really large house. Uh, that is going to eventually be on the hill. Th this area is all a historic preservation, uh, historic district anyway, already on the historic register. But the individual properties are doing that separately. Um, the new owners of uh, this, the Ben Owens farm are working toward that end, and we're, we're sort of helping them with that. And the, the original size property was quite large. If you can see, you probably can't see too much of it. But this area... This is Dorothy Owens. Dorothy was mom. I'll tell you about Dorothy here in a minute. Dorothy, Dorothy was a real character. Um, so we've got Dorothy here, and it goes all the way up here because this is her son, Thomas. 
And Dorothy alone has almost 500 acres. And Thomas has a spot that's just about there. And if you go across here, you see this where it says PS. If you come over to about here on the map, that's where Cascades Creek meets Griffey Creek. Just forget I-69. How many of you remember before four lane was there? And had to drive that wacky road to Indianapolis. All of that was gone. That was all one community. That was all one neighborhood. And they were all in contact with Stouts Creek. And guess what Stouts Creek is made out of? Harrodsburg limestone. Everywhere. Here's another wall. See how tall it is? How straight it is? And we all think of our posture at that point. And we all, you know, get your posture. Look at the size of this wall. You can see the coping stones on the top. Some of those have been replaced and repaired. This farm has been maintained well. It is the largest stand of um, stone walls that we know of in the county, contiguous in one, one area. I'm pretty sure that Ben really wanted a gentleman's estate. And by the way, he came directly from Ireland. Uh, un unknown details in his family tree, which I'll share with you in a minute. You may have seen articles in the HT from time to time. Um, and the HT, I mean the paper that carries that name in various pieces parts, which we'll probably hear about in the upcoming session. But uh, the Ben Owens farm is also known as Fair Dodhead, which I had never heard. The Ferris family lived there. The Tufflers lived there. They had lots of antiques. Um, the Bowers had a B&B, a, B &B, a bread, bed and breakfast. And the Ray family, uh, married into the family, and that's who owns it now. But look right here at the house, and look at this, look at this thing. And this goes all the way around the property. Here's another look, and you can see a fence, and then you can see a large field, and then you see the house beyond that. And this is a whole enclave. This is all covered with these beautiful stone walls. Now the there's a report called the Interim Report, which is historic. Uh, a group of volunteers uh, put together a report to document the historic properties as we knew them, starting in, uh, I believe, in the 70s, and it was published in the 80s. You can buy both that one and the Bloomington one from uh, Bloomington Restorations, by the way. Uh, they're 20 bucks. They're just amazing if you like uh, old houses and properties and things. So. There's a one, that's what the interim report is. Now, there's no citation and some things that we hoped might have been discussed in that report are, are missing, but this report indicates that the walls they think might have been built around 1870. We're not sure why, now, stay tuned, we may know more shortly. And how many of you know where Bales Road is? All right, think, um, go past Cascades, past the old, uh, toboggan run past the old uh, outdoor theater, um, two-lane road. Before you get to the bridge, there's a road that cuts up to Kinzer Pike. That's Bales. Now, if 69 wasn't there, what would you do? You'd go right over the hill to Stouts Creek. It's all right there. Just get rid of the big interstate, and you've got a contiguous neighborhood. Stouts Creek and then over the hill, and there you have this very long, I don't have a picture of it yet, because we were, we were too late to get it before the, the leaves came on, and you can't see it in the summer. But next time you go out that way, turn on Bales Road, and across from the IU, there's a sort of a bee, bee station there where they're tracking honeybees, just across from that, and I think Dr. Shabarami owned that property, or maybe his uh, family still does, um, there's a long wall hidden behind all of the invasive species. And it cuts back along the property line. That also, guess what? It has the check cereal in it. So we know it all came from the same thing. Now, I'm going to bore you with a little genealogy, because that's my thing. I'm really into genealogy. I was a little confused by the whole Ben Owens things, because Ben Owens wasn't an Owens. He was an Inman. And I didn't understand how all of that got to be. So here's that story. John Owens did, in fact, purchase the initial 300 acres in this area in 1816, the first land grab. John Owens uh, was able to buy some, some land there. 
Now, Benjamin Inman, who was also an immigrant from Ireland, uh, arrived in 18, sometime in 1837, directly from Ireland with his wife, Dorothy, and five kids. Now, I think Ben was a toddler of three. So I, I doubt that he remembers much about Ireland. But Benjamin has the bad choice to die shortly thereafter, doesn't leave a will, but John, being a nice guy, marries Dorothy and has the five children as his heirs. So they adopt the name Owens, but they all keep the Inman. Even on their headstones in Rose Hill, they all say first name Inman Owens which I think is really quite a treasure to be able to, to have done that. Um, John, unfortunately, doesn't hang around long either, but he did have a will. And in his will, I have to love him for this, all five children, including the one girl, get equal billing in the estate. He ensures in his will that the boys all get their stuff but Jane also gets her share of equal amount. They can sell, they can do whatever they want, but she gets equal billing. I just love that. I think that's pretty special. Now, if I, and uh, the boys are still young, so they're not old enough to build fences. You know, they're, they're, we don't even know where they are. We don't know if they're still in Greek County. We don't know if they're here, but the, the will takes forever, almost seven years to probate, because the, the Van Inman stuff is still not resolved. The land is still not sold in Greene County. So you've got Greene County, you've got Monroe County, you've got no will, you've got a will, you've got courts back and forth and people that are just, and you know, somewhere in there, Dorothy disappeared. Because the court records tell us that, that some, somebody claiming to be her husband, in fact, I did find a marriage record, said, she's left me. The whole thing is a little wonky. Well, we'll figure it out as we go through it. But eventually, Ben and Thomas are the two that stay here. Ben is actually named in the will by John as Ben will live there and work the farm. It's specified in the will, which is also very interesting. So we find Ben and Dorothy, we think. At least Dorothy's listed. We're not sure if she actually lived there, but she's listed in the 1860 census. Um, and Ben and Thomas have Civil War registration records. I don't, have not found any, uh, any service record yet. Now, 1864 comes along, and there's a huge big brick mansion has been built, or is in the process of being built. When it was renovated, they found a brick that was dated 1864. Now, there's no clay on the property. Remember, this is, this is checks mixed land. So there's not a lot of clay. So the brick had to be brought in from somewhere else. So those bricks were made somewhere else, this brick could be early, it could be late, but because it's in the building, the guesstimate or the working theory is the house was at least started to be built in 1863. Uh, and you can read all about it. You can Google it and, and come up with it. Uh, some of the walls are like three feet thick. It's a really impressive mansion. Uh, if we fast forward to 1870, we find Dorothy Thomas and Ben still living in the same place, even though there were two properties. Remember there are two farms, two plots? Uh, it looks like they're all living in the same place. Now, fast forward to later that year, we find that Ben is marrying his neighbor, Martha Jane Blair, whose mother was from Ireland. His father was local, uh, or at least one generation local. Uh, we find Thomas in 1876, who at 43 marries his uh, just to the west neighbor, uh, Rebecca Woodall. And they have one child, who is Fred. Uh, how many of you ever banked at People State Bank? Fred Inman created People State Bank. Yet the one, yet. Fred Inman Owen, this is him. Yep, that's him. I went, wait a minute, I know that name. And there you go, I found out that he was the one who started People State Bank. We also have um, the name uh, in 1878, we have a stone that has been etched in 1878 with the signature J. Adams that is on one of the Maple Grove roads right across from the Ben Owens farm. Now the Ben Owens farm is all one thing and this road went through it to Mount Tabor. Back in this day, Mount Tabor was a thing. It's not so much a thing anymore. But the road went right through the property. So what do you think happened? 
They've got balls on both sides of the road to keep people from getting on the property. One of those walls on the east side has this stone etched with J. Adams. So again, we're starting to see a time frame here of when these walls may have been constructed. Uh, we get to 1880, and Thomas and Ben are living on, pro on different properties, but ad adjacent. Uh, ben has now a one child named Charles. And there's somebody named George Wiley that is living on the property as a servant. I want you to just note that. And I just found George this week. I've been looking for George for six months. And I never saw him because I wasn't looking for him here. He was living at the Ben Owens farm. And then in 1917, Fred, who was the executor of the state, had Ben liquidate all of his assets, so his estate was a little easier than what had been the case from his father. So really, Fred was a really smart guy, I think. All right, the Owens farm, we have anecdotal information, we have undocumented information, which is why if you've got paper, I need to see it. Uh, but the suggestion is that the walls were all built in the, the 1870s, and we're beginning to see that that time frame does make sense. And over a period of 10 years, if this information that was passed down through the, through the years from owner to owner, from neighbor to neighbor is right, George Wiley was paid a dollar a day for a perch, sometimes called a rod, of 16 and a half feet of wall. Now, if you go down there and you pick up some of those rocks, you're going to go, now, wait a minute. <laughs> These things are heavy. So just think about the labor intensiveness of how that would happen. We also have anecdotal information. Uh, don't want to go there yet. Back up. Um, Oh, well, we'll just let it sit there and you can salivate over the picture. Uh, we have anecdotal information from uh, research interviews that were done in the 1970s by folklore students. Again, we love you, all of the folklore professors who pushed that, uh, of stories that grandparents told of ox carts coming up from Stouts Creek with wagon loads of stone. So we know that it sounds like the wagon loads came up from the creek and delivered the stone. and and eight to 10 a day, my goodness. Who was down in the creek loading them? That's what I wanna know. You know. So how many of you know where we are? We're gonna jump around the county now. All right, we are at the Speedway, right? Look at the size of that puppy, have you seen it? How many cars have run into that? <laughs> Couple hundred maybe? Um, and what do you see? Crinoids, hello, and geodes. And this is, this is uh, another, and you can see that these are somewhat in disrepair. <laughs> and they possibly are not exactly where they were originally built. But we do know that there was a farmhouse up on, the, uh, up on the hill here that fits with the timeline of the Stip Bender Farm and some of the Clear Creek properties. So it's very likely that the original walls, which these probably are not, it's very likely that those walls were put together in the same time period, the latter half of the 1800s. Now we're gonna move around a little bit. You know where you are? We just popped up north. Go about past Griffey Lake, go up Headley Road, and you slam into uh, Bethel Lane. If you go right, you go to Unionville. If you go left, you go to Marlin School. These are the walls and they're very, some of them are very in bad, bad shape here. But those go around part of, not the entire cemetery, but part of it. We don't have any information on Bethel Church or the history. There's very limited information at the History Center. So again, if you have contacts or you know people, uh, we'd love to know more about, uh, about how these might have gotten there. And I didn't, I didn't think about travel uh, uh, layovers and, and, and sleepovers here, but we're going to now go south. So go west and go south, all the way down near Harrodsburg, and think of where George Ketchum first built his properties. This is where Ketchum Cemetery is, a gorgeous view. And this wall is quite extensive. See how long that thing is? 
And you'll notice here there's a limestone pillar. We often see these limestone pillars as ending points on the, the local walls. Conversely, when you look at the CCC, they're more of a squared off center with a conical shaped co coping stones at the top. So and, and in addition to the mortar. So you can often visually tell that they're not uh, from this period or possibly not from this period. The um, Ketchum Cemetery was started in 1830, but it's unlikely in 1830 when people were just clearing land to build cabins that they were taking the time and labor to build the fences. Where presumably those came a little bit later. So we're, again, that's a projection. We don't quite know, but I can't imagine anybody in 1935 out not collecting food and, and firewood and building a stone wall instead. Um, Monroe County cemeteries, there's a bunch of them where we have, uh, and that was a cemetery, but now we're going to look at the whole county. Uh, and these are some of the uh, cemeteries that have dry stack stone walls. There is a History Center book that's not over here, but I have a copy down here, which is newly published within the last four or five years. And it goes through and gives you a really good history overview with pictures of all of the known cemeteries in the county and the missing or absent or somebody plowed them over because they didn't know they were there kind of cemeteries. So if we go through the county, and like I mentioned earlier, I have township maps. If you know where there's a wall, please tell us. Oh, Bean Blossom Township. How many of you are from there? Bean Blossom? OK, at least one. All right. So Old Dutch Church, the Pewitt Fife, sometimes spelled Fife, on Creek Bend. You know where that is? That's smack dab in the middle of Oliver Winery, their, their new Creek Bend property. I wasn't able to get there. It's, uh, I will work with them to get some pictures. But um, the book does mention that there is a wall there. And the Walker Cemetery. You may not know where these are. That's OK. You can look them up, but just get a sense of the density of where these are. Now let's pop on over to Bloomington Township, which we're in Bloomington. And it goes north from here. And it goes further north than you think it does. <coughs> There's an Armstrong Cemetery, which is pretty small near Maple Grove. You've got the Bethel Lane, which we just looked at. How many of you know where the Dunn Cemetery is on the IU campus? Now you've walked by it 100 times. Did you see the, the dry stack stone wall? It's really quite substantive. It's tall. Uh, and, and if there's anybody in the room that works for IU, it is broken down in two places. And I sent pictures to Polly, and she sent them on. We need to egg them on. They're supposed to keep that cemetery in good shape. Those fences need to be repaired. Thank you, IU. Maple Grove Church, uh, which is on that little funny jig jog on Maple Grove at Maple Grove at Maple Grove at Maple Grove. And Mount Gilead, which we now know when it was started. And Rogers of Fee Lane. How many of you go up Fee Lane from Campus North? Did you realize there's a little cemetery right there in front of Forest? Foster, sorry, Foster. If you never noticed it, you need to look at it. Now, my guess is it's in such perfect shape, uh, and it it is right next to the roads. I believe that it probably had to be rebuilt. There was a man named Chambers who was interviewed in the 70s who was hired by AU just to rebuild stone walls and make stone walls. And he gave a lot of information about how that process worked at IU. And I suspect that he was involved in redoing those walls because they look really nice. And you know that there was a dump truck that hit it more than once in creating all that stuff up there. OK, drop down south to Clear Creek. Um, and there's a further down near Monroe Lake, there's one called Deckard One. There's a whole bunch of Deckards. I know there's at least one Deckard uh, uh, person who came from, my brain is descendant in the room. Um, but I'm pretty sure that that one has to be the CCC because it appears to have mortar and it has that conical shaped corner. I've not been there in person. Uh, but I will go check it out, but I'm pretty sure that that one doesn't qualify. And then Ketchum, which we saw uh, pictures of. All right, so pop down to Perry Township, down at Clear Creek. We've got Clear Creek Church, uh, which was deeded by uh, Matthews and part of that from the, uh, the Campbells, who first owned the, the Step Bender Farm, and Covenanter. 
right at the corner of High and the roads changed names, Hillside and Moores Creek, right? Moores Pike, yeah. Um, how many of you have seen that and not realized that that was a dry stack stone wall? That's been there a long time. That was one of the first um, cemeteries in the county. Uh, and now keep in mind, the Monroe County Historic Preservation Board of Review is dealing with things in the county. That's in the city. But in my researching of the walls, I'm trying to collectively look at everything as a whole to kind of see you know, when things were done and how they all fit together. But this technically is in the city, so yeah, I still included it. And then in Washington Township, Devin, I think you're in the room, yes? You're our Washington expert. Do you know where this is? Haha, <laughs> uh, go to Sample Road, the new one, where you can sometimes cross and sometimes can't, and then take the access road that's now Wayport Road, that used to be Wayport Road, but it isn't Wayport Road, south, and then before you get to our cut through there on Wiley, tucked back in there somewhere is Turner Ridge, and it has a fence, and I've not seen it, because I couldn't find it, but it's there, and we'll find it. Any, I'm going to stop for a minute and see if there are any questions. We're good? One over here, yes. How was the foundation for the uh, dry stack stone? Did they have a foundation or did they just put them on the ground? A good question. Um, I knew I would not have time today to talk about the construction. I mean, if that's something of interest, we can certainly put that together. There is, by the way, a dry stone conservancy spiral notebook up here that talks about how to repair the walls that will give you dimensions and all of the details of how the walls are constructed. Basically, as I understand it, if it's kind of like a headstone. If you've got a four-foot headstone, you're probably going to have a three to four-foot base under underground. These all have very solid uh, footers, if you will, made from the same limestone. Uh, and, and stacked up. They're, they're larger and wider at the base, and they may be like five feet at the base and taper up to like two feet at the top. So they're conical in shape in that way. They're not straight walls. Uh, and some are narrower in places than others. So uh, yes, they have wonderful sound bases, uh, but th they also are a little bit movable with a little bit of earthquake movement going on. Um, that, and, and the walls have a flexibility to them. Uh, so those, they're not concrete, they are from the same, same rock. Does that help? Great. So other known locations that we know for sure there are Bales Road I mentioned, along Church Lane, and those are in pretty bad shape. Uh, Beck's Crossing area, oh, we're going, we're finding a neighborhood again. We're going from Clear Creek across to Beck's Crossing over to Speedway, that all seems to be connected. Um, we have the wall remnants in the Step Bender area. And then let's go back to I-69 and take that exit to Bedford. Go down, remember the gas station? Remember Victor Pike? And we're going to hop over to the west side. Big field, right? There's a nice wall there. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So, so just park that for a minute. Along Victor Pike, there's some beautiful pictures of those available somewhere in our, uh, in our serv service that we did earlier. The Matthews Mansion uh, in, in Ellisville, sort of the, you know, the, everybody thinks of that as the place to go. Uh, the Ellisville, right where the Village Inn used to be, there's a really crumbly wall right through that, um, that uh, parking lot. Stouts Creek Road at Arlington and Shelburne Road. These are places I haven't quite identified. They're sort of alluded to in the, the listing records, but that would all make sense because they're right there by Stouts Creek, but I don't know much about them. So if you know about them, if you've seen them, you know exactly where they are, please let us know. Okay, so human history. Now, who were the people that built? How are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, we're good. The information sources I mentioned include interviews, there's family histories, the Monroe County Library has some, Monroe County History Center has some, 
Um, there's too many for me to get through in a lifetime. So I would love if any of you have family histories, go through them and look for references for dry stack stone walls. I've been pouring through Rachel Peden's books, and uh, her son Joe is here today, and she alludes to the walls from time to time in just the most glorious language, and I, I so enjoy them. And she mentions one of those limestone pillars that as the farm implements got bigger, um, they would n like knock things over. And one of her neighbors knocked over one of their limestone pillar markers, which probably used to have a wall next to it. And um, th the answer was, we're just gonna go fix it. And that's what happened. They just went, they, they fixed it and put it back. So we have these interviews that have been re preserved, uh, some in the IU archives, some in, like I said, the History Center and the library, some in the family histories. Uh, there are notations and publications, nominations for the National Register. There are some scattered books and papers uh, by different area residents. So you never know where something is going to hide, like in a church record where a wall was built, where maybe you can find an answer. Um, by the way, I'm offering a reward for some lost references. One of them is Rachel Peden's uh, wrote, wrote a paper for the Monroe County Historical Society in May of 1960. Now, I know y'all were here for that. You probably were at the meeting, right? Um, somebody's got a copy of that. I will pay real money. Ten bucks. No, we, we really need that puppy because it's cited in half a dozen National Historic Register nominations, but nobody has it. We need that document. Uh, Judith Bunns, and if I had an hour, I would tell you the story of how I tracked her down and had a two-hour conversation with her. She had a groundbreaking paper that she wrote for her senior thesis in 1971 where she was able to interview dozens of families who were the people who built the walls. That's also missing. And Judith had a copy, but her house burned to the ground. And anyway, wait, that's a long, long story. Um, delightful woman. She got her doctorate at IU a couple years later and then went to work for the government. We also have um, two papers by a woman named Judy Hetrick, who also got her PhD at IU. And she says she's a pack rat and she's looking. I don't have, I don't have copies yet. And then finally, there was a piece on the Fife House by uh, Rita Gay that was done in 1974. All of these have some really important data that would relate to the fences. So if you ever see them, hear of them, know of those names, uh, I would be eternally grateful and it will, you know, maybe I'll take you to lunch, but some sort of reward. So we do know that a man named Frank Sater came back from the Civil War and was paid by the um, folks at Maple Grove to build the wall around Maple Grove Church circa 1868-1878 for $275. That was good payback then, I think. And that does not include the oxens hauling the stones up. I don't know how that was covered. But that was his contribution. We also have historic references to the fence which goes across the creek there on Maple Grove, which is falling in. This is a picture of it. That this was built by old man Ellet. I've we've heard Ellet before. Ellet still. Um, so old man, whoever he is, which whichever Ellet he was, there were a bunch of them around, so I haven't figured out which one he is yet. But he built that wall for a hundred dollars. Huh. That seems like a lot less than two seventy. So I'm wondering, you know, was this earlier? This is reported to have a 10 to 12 foot base. We're talking about bases. This is said to have a very big base because it's supporting a lot of stone, which has now fallen in. On Maple Grove Road, we have that J. Adams um, stone that's etched that I mentioned, dated in 1878. And remember that guy who was living in Ben Owen's house? George Wiley. George Wiley was paid, and we know this because of the stack of papers that has been passed down from owner to owner to owner of that house. Specifically mentions George Wiley. So I, I don't have my hands on the paper yet. I'm getting it, but I've talked 
with the owners, and I know that it's there. And that's why I was looking for George Wiley, but I couldn't find him. And there he was, sitting right in front of my face in the census. Duh. That just goes to show you, you see stuff that you don't see stuff. So where are the stones? Um, if this is a close-up of the Maple Grove area, I have a huge map over here which shows the full geology of Monroe County for the geeks in the room. And it's just next to the speaker over there. This is a piece of it. And the part that you want to look at is, you can see here that this obviously is, uh, this is up here is uh, where Bean Blossom comes in. You got Griffey here. You got Cascades coming up. And this is the Stout Creek area. And so the grayish stone right along here is all, what do you think? What has it got in it? Chex Mix, yeah. It's, it's the Harrodsburg limestone. And we see that same limestone down where we see the Ketchum area and the Clear Creek area, the same layer is right at the surface. It's funny how that works. The rock is like right there. It's kind of weird. Now, I'm, I'm going to quote here Cheryl Munson. She's in the room, so she could probably read it herself. And I'm not going to read all the words. But basically, this is from an HT article where she talks about the Harrodsburg limestone formation. Um, talks about how easy it is to manipulate the stone. Easy being if you've got like, if you lift weights for a living, easy. Um, and this deposit runs from up near Gosport all the way down into Kentucky, at this particular strand. There's a second paragraph, and again, I'm not going to read all the way through it, but you get the sense that it's easily worked in, in terms of, you know, uh, people who do this for a living. And then the question is how much of it was actually field gathered, how much of it was quarried. We do have some anecdotal information that the Ben Owens farm was quarried from Stout's Creek. Some of that they can tell from the marks on the stone, which, which clearly shows some hand carving took place. So we're not quite sure. It's not as important as my goal was to try to date these. And that, that tells us a lot. So local preservation goals, I mean, why do we care? If you don't know, the Historic Preservation Board of Review was started in 2001. And um, no, we don't go around telling you what color to paint your house. Our goal is really about maintaining the historic structures and, and uh, value of the buildings and neighborhoods that are, are significant to remember and that we want to hold dear. So that's, that's what our board does. And the historic preservation is just the practice of, of protecting and sometimes finding ways to restore those kind of things and certainly documenting them. Um, you, you've heard lots of stories about how all of that works. And um, you see this wall. I'd love to have enough money, enough grants to take every wall and just rebuild it. Now that some of them are on private property, so that gets problematic. But still, you get the idea of that's what historic preservation is. And because these walls are limestone, that's a part of our limestone heritage. And so there are multiple layers here. I mean, think about the agricultural heritage that is present in just the Stipbender farm and in the, the Owens farms and the Maple Grove area. That agricultural history is what started in Monroe County. It was well before the dimensional limestone boom. I mean, we were farmers well before we were much of anything else. Um, we also were educators from very early on. So that's, that's another piece of it. But um, we want to preserve and acknowledge the importance of what those large farms were. Uh, we want to research, document who the people were and what they were doing and why they were building. You know, we want to discover and record how long are the walls, where might they have been, uh, and are they all, in fact, Chex Mix based, which is interesting. I don't know yet. We're, so far, they all seem to have the Chex Mix in them. And then continue our educational efforts. Those of you who are interested in limestone on the 17th of June, uh, behind the Geology Building from 9 a.m. to noon is a limestone festival. There'll be an opportunity to actually carve some limestone. You can talk to geologists. I'll be there talking about our work. Um, some other uh, not-for-profits will be there where we'll be focusing on things limestone. So if you have an opportunity to come out that morning, do so. Now, I mentioned the Rumkey site, which is that off to the west of uh, the road to Bedford. And this is one of the walls that is part of the original Stipp Bender farm. 
It was cut in half by that road. And this wall was isolated. Now, when Rumpke bought it, they wanted to put in their uh, storage facilities there. And the Historic Preservation Board was able to step in and eke in and say, wait just a minute. There's a dry stack stone wall there. We're not going to plow that over. We're going to do something with it. And to their benefit, Rumkey has been absolutely wonderful. Everything has been finished recently. Um, and they agreed to clean it up, get some of the invasive species removed, take down some of the trees, and repair the wall. The Dry Stone Conservancy out of Kentucky that I mentioned earlier, they came up and did a lot of the work. And there's an agreement for maintenance and education right there on that site. The Dry Stone Conservancy will be able to do. So it's a win-win for everybody. We get to keep the wall, and it's a stunning example of something that's isolated from anything else. So you can't really see it from the road, uh, but maybe someday you can see it up close and personal. So for the future, keep an eye out for those lovely stone pillars that might say, hey, hey, I used to be a wall. And interestingly, you also see hardware. And the hardware would have been for a gate. And I'm wondering if it was the sewerage factory that maybe was generating a lot of uh, gates and metal, and uh, they were active at the same time. Uh, we know for a fact that there is, if you go north on Hart Street, you're in Ellettsville, sorry, go to Ellettsville, go north on Hart Street, over to your right, there's an old stage stop there. If you didn't know, that's pretty cool anyway. Um, there's a house there that was a stage stop. And if you look at the wall when it's not summer, <laughs> you can see that it is absolutely made of the Harrodsburg uh, carved stone. It used to be a fence. Now, was it built as a retaining wall? I don't know. Did it used to be a fence? I don't know. I just know the stone's there. On Pro Road, it just down from um, the Reed Quarry and just west of North High School, there is a line, a road there. Now, curiously, if you go just past that and forget I-69 is there, where are you? You're on Acuff Road. And where does that go? Stouts Creek. Same neighborhood. Um, Headley Road. If you go to Headley School, what used to be Matlock Road and before the bypass was there, you go to Headley School and turn north like you're going to Griffey. There's a house about halfway along that road there before you get to uh, Maple, Maple Turn, Maple Leaf. Um, take a look at it. The whole side of the, the lawn is this, this stone. And it cuts back also into the property. So originally, was there a wall there? Very possibly. Hiding in plain sight right there. The stones didn't get there themselves. Somebody had to bring them. And then we also have anecdotal information of another wall that was uh, on Bethel Lane. Ding, 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 ding. We talked about Bethel Lane earlier, right? Um, and just further down from that, just west of Bolton House, what's there now? Happy Hollow. Happy Hollow was built in 1974. What do you think happened to that wall? I bet it was plowed under. Glenn and I had our first house there in that corner, so we're probably sitting where, where the wall used to be, our first house. So to doggone it, I didn't know that there used to be a wall there. So if you know a place where there used to be a wall, please let us know. Uh, so Dry Stack Stone Wall Project is an ongoing thing. We want to find where they are. If we've missed one, uh, we want to document the location. We got some GPSs for all of our photographs. And we're going to coordinate that with the interim report so everything is consistent. We want to identify the stone type, the dimensions, and the construction used, which will then help us to possibly identify the builders, because every builder had a little different technique. When you use that data to research options in the future to preserve, protect, and restore what we can. And then we want to map the locations to allow so we're all of us to kind of see and get that sense of neighborhood that I've been talking about or areas that I've talked about and match that to the geology. So again, if you have the time to, to plot on our, our township maps before you go, that would be really great to have that feedback. And just put a post-it note over there. Uh, and if you want, put your name and number. So if I have a question, I can call you. And then just beware. You'll see lots of stone walls. We don't really care about stone walls. We're after dry stack stone walls. Um, so if they've got mortar or they're made from nice little squares, you know, retaining stone from Menards, we're not after those. 
Um, and if you've got a wall or you think there was a wall or you like me, I, I remember when I was maybe 12, and I had a friend who lived on Weimer Road, right next to Wapahani, back when it was a scout camp. And we were running through the woods. I don't ask me why, I have no idea. But we were running through the woods, going south, and she said, look out, there's a stone fence you have to hop over. I, what? Right there in the middle of the woods, a log, I remember it like it was yesterday. Now I go out there and all I see are trees, so I can't find it. But if you know Weimer Road and you remember a wall, please let me know that I'm not nuts, that I do remember that happening. Limestone, not just for skinny dipping. Check, check out our website. We have tons of resources, links to the History Center, links to the, the library. Clay Stuckey has tons of work in limestone, and all of his articles are there. They're just amazing to read through. The ubiquitous Holdleys, the mansion, the Mathers Mansion. Take the time to look at that page because it has links to teaching um, it, we, we have uh, worked with Ball State so that we have a curriculum for all levels of school. And we're actually doing a teaching workshop this summer, three-day free workshop. If you know a teacher who's in the limestone, they'll actually get to do some carving. It's coming up quickly. It's three weeks away. So if you know anybody that might be interested, make sure you get that word out. I thought you might enjoy this one. Everybody knows where that is, right? Yeah. So this is a thank you to the people who've helped to date. Uh, not everybody is there, but I think I've got most everybody. And I'll just throw it open to any questions that are out there. Yes? That demarcation and listing, it doesn't appear on any of the other stones that we know of. Any other questions? Back in the back, Devin. Uh, yes, so, uh, I'm also a Why don't you come up and use the mic? Anybody else? Thank you all. You've been wonderful. Well, we, we need each and every one of you to help us build this database. And Devin has a question. Thank you very much. So I'm also a first, first generation Monroe Countyan, but fifth generation Irish American. And in Ireland, on the stone walls, a lot of times they have sections of stone that they will periodically remove to move animals through and things like that. But they'll also have styles built in to be able to go over the fence or through the fence. Did you see any evidence of areas where stone would be periodically removed, or did you see anywhere that there were styles built in? We have not seen that. We do have the, the limestone steps down at Step Bender that go nowhere, um, but it looks like those these kind of walls may not have been used for that kind of movement. Anybody else? We got one more? Cheryl. There is a style on Maple Grove Road, and I took a photo of it, and uh, Historic Preservation Board was given a copy. So if you can find my photos. Okay, great. And I, I will point out down here on our kiosk that a lot of these pieces were developed by Cheryl Munson. So, ha, ha, ha. 